Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. James Campbell. James is a recent PhD graduate from the University of Calgary. James is originally from Ottawa in Ontario. He obtained his bachelor's degree in earth sciences at Carleton University. For his senior undergrad thesis, James studied the fossilized assemblage of foraminifera, a type of microscopic plankton, to better, understand, to better constrain the age of the Eagle Plain Basin of the Yukon Territory, a marine basin that was part of the northern end of the Western Interior Seaway during the middle part of the Cretaceous. While conducting fieldwork in the Yukon, he discovered a fossil vertebra of a marine reptile, which turned out to be the first plesiosaur fossil ever discovered from that territory. For his master's thesis, James decided to stay at Carleton University and conducted a systematic reevaluation of the horned dinosaurs Chasmosaurus and Vagaceratops from the late Cretaceous of Alberta and Saskatchewan. After completing his master's degree, he moved to Alberta to begin his PhD in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Calgary. For his dissertation, James investigated plesiosaur body size differences between individuals preserved in marine and non-marine settings in the late Cretaceous of Western Canada. Shortly after successfully defending his PhD in December of 2019, James became a new father and welcomed the arrival of his son, who is in the audience today. <laughs> Yay, that, I think it's worth a round of applause. <laughs> So James has participated in paleontological and geological fieldwork expeditions in Alberta, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Mongolia. On the side, he enjoys camping, marathon running, and playing the bagpipes. Today, James will talk about the discovery of the oldest dinosaur from Alberta. So without further delay, I present you Dr. James Campbell. Thank you, Francois. <laughs> Thank you, Francois. Thank you all for being here. So, and thank, thank you to the Royal Terrell Museum, of course, for inviting me to give this talk today. So, today I'll be talking about a really cool collaborative project that I had the great opportunity to be a part of. And this project involved five other people at the University of Calgary, University of Michigan, and the Royal Ontario Museum. This project involved the discovery of, the discovery and collection of some new fossils new fossils um, from southwestern Alberta in the Rocky Mountains. These fossils are terrestrial vertebrate remains, and they include the oldest dinosaur remains from Western Canada. And this project was recently published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences as an article. And I thank my co-authors for allowing me to give this talk today. Before I delve into this uh, new discovery, I'd first like to go over some background with you on the uh, general dinosaur body fossil record of Canada. Canada has a very rich non-avian dinosaur fossil record, and this has contributed greatly to our global understanding of dinosaurs, of the diversity, paleoecology, and behavior of dinosaurs. And even though the dinosaur-bearing rocks in Canada have been intensively prospected for over a hundred years, major discoveries are still being made every year. In fact, every single one of these dinosaurs here was named within the last five years and many of them you are probably familiar with. And several of these are on display here at the Royal Terrell Museum. So this map here shows the distribution of dinosaur sites that are currently known throughout Canada. And as you can see, the distribution here is quite unevenly distributed with the vast majority of these sites located in what is now Alberta, Saskatchewan, a fewer in British Columbia, and comparatively fewer in the Arctic and the Maritimes. And some of the reasons for why these sites are distributed the way they are, has to do with the proximity of these sites to infrastructure and population centers, as well as the degree of accessibility of these sites. Another reason has to do with the fact that these sites are largely exposed on the surface and not covered with dense vegetation. However, a much larger reason for why these are distributed the way they are has to do with the repeated advance and retreat of glaciers. The these heavy ice sheets basically pulverized and removed um, the vast majority of Mesozoic aged or dinosaur aged rocks from central Canada. And as a result, the vast majority of, of uh, Mesozoic aged rocks in Canada have now been relegated to Western Canada 
and comparatively fewer patches in the high Arctic and in the Maritimes. So unfortunately, for the most part, we have no hope of finding any dinosaurs within the area surrounding Hudson's Bay. The Canadian dinosaur fossil record extends from the latest Triassic to the latest Cretaceous, spanning approximately 140 million years. And despite the disproportionately high number of dinosaur sites out in the West, the oldest dinosaur site in Canada actually comes from Nova Scotia. And this site is uh, latest Triassic to earliest Jurassic in age. So if you look at this, these Nova Scotian dinosaurs come from the latest Triassic to earliest Jurassic McCoy Brook formation exposed along the Bay of Fundy. And the fossils that have been found so far are relatively fragmentary when compared with dinosaurs from say, Dinosaur Provincial Park in uh, Southern Alberta. However, they are sufficiently complete to be able to be uh, assigned to some type of prosauropod, which is a basal member of the group that includes large-bodied sauropods, such as Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus, as well as some type of ornithischian, based on a single tooth. These Nova Scotian dinosaurs are an outlier to the Canadian dinosaur fossil record, not only spatially, but also temporally. And what I mean by that is if we just focus on essentially every other site except for the one in Nova Scotia, we can see here that the fossil record of dinosaurs is significantly shorter, extending only from the late Jurassic to the latest Cretaceous. The dinosaur fossil record in Western Canada extends from the latest Jurassic to the latest Cretaceous, approximately 85 million years in duration. And up until recently, dinosaur body fossils, including bones, teeth, and soft tissues, were recently thought to be restricted to the last 18 million years of the Cretaceous. And the remainder of this fossil record consists of trace fossils in the form of footprints and trackways. These footprints are, we, we cannot determine which specific species these dinosaurs, which were, which specific species um, made these footprints, but we have a pretty good idea of what types of dinosaurs made these. And with this, with these uh, trackways, we, can tell that not only, we can tell that dinosaurs were not only present in Western Canada during this time, but we also have a pretty good idea of what types of dinosaurs were present. So one of these footprints comes from the, the uh, early Cretaceous of Alberta, described by Henderson in 2017. This very well-preserved footprint comes from the Gladstone Formation of the early Cretaceous of Alberta. Henderson 2017 described this footprint as belonging to an iguanodontid, based on the morphology of the morphology and orientation of its toes. And this is a very significant fossil as it represents the very first evidence of iguanodontids from Alberta. A slightly older site from the uh, earlier Cretaceous was described by McCray and colleagues in 2014. So this site here is a trackway that comes from the early Cretaceous uh, uh, Gorman Creek formation of West Central British Columbia. And this site has a few footprints here, which you can see, which I've outlined. McCray and colleagues 2014 described this footprint, these footprints as having been made by some type of a theropod based on the triradiate shape and the elongate digits. However, the oldest trackway from Western Canada comes from the latest Jurassic of, of Southeastern British Columbia, described by McCray and colleagues 2014. This site here, includes an enormous trackway from the uh, Miss Mountain Formation of Southeastern British Columbia, being latest Jurassic in age. And as you can see the person in the foreground, it's an enormous trackway. And based on, based on this, McCray and colleagues described this trackway as having been made by a large-bodied sauropod. The site is significant as it represents one of the very first, uh, one of the very few occurrences of sauropods within Canada. Apart from sauropod and other dinosaur trackways in the Miss Mountain Formation, this formation has also produced this large cluster of large quartzite pebbles. And it's, yeah, these pebbles were found in a coal seam, and they're larger grained than the sediments that they were found in. Based on this, McCray and colleagues suggested that these stones may have actually been inside of a dinosaur in the form of stomach stones or gastroliths. And gastroliths are commonly found in the skeletons of dinosaurs and other vertebrates, both living and extinct, and they were used to help with digestion. We have very good evidence that dinosaurs 
roamed Western Canada from the late Jurassic to late Cretaceous. However, up until recently, the vast majority of this fossil record has been, has been composed of footprints and trackways. In some cases, possibly gastroliths that were once in the body cavity of some of these dinosaurs. However, for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about just the body fossil record in Western Canada. So up until recently, like I said, the dinosaur body fossil record in Western Canada was thought to be restricted to the last 18 million years of the Cretaceous. And the vast majority of these fossils were found in highly fossiliferous areas of Western Canada, including places like Dinosaur Provincial Park, the Milk River area of Southern Alberta, the Grand Prairie area, and of course, Southwestern Saskatchewan. Collectively, these sites have contributed greatly to our understanding of dinosaurs during the late Cretaceous. And collectively, these sites span approximately 18 million years and were deposited alongside a vast inland seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. This seaway divided North America into the microcontinents of Laramidia on the west and Appalachia on the east. This relatively shallow seaway was quite variable in size and extended from the Boreal Sea in the north to the Tethys Sea in the south. The main reason why, historically, the dinosaur body fossil record in Western Canada was thought to be restricted to the last 18 million years of the Cretaceous has largely to do with the distribution of Mesozoic rock in this part of the country. So this is a geological map of Western Canada. The colors correspond to different aged rocks. So you can see a lot of reds and pinks over towards Hudson's Bay. Those are much older rocks that um, uh, are part of the Canadian Shield and have been scraped bare by uh, glaciation. The area that I have outlined here represents the largest patch of Mesozoic aged rock or dinosaur aged rock from Western Canada or Canada as a whole rather. There are smaller patches of Mesozoic aged rock in Western Canada, but I haven't shown them here. Within this large patch here though, it is very expansive. However, the vast majority of it is covered with late Cretaceous or younger aged rocks. There are older Jurassic and early Cretaceous rocks in this region, but they're exposed in either more remote areas, such as the Fort McMurray area, or in more mountainous areas where rocks have been folded and buckled upwards, um, exposing older rocks below. My wife took this picture on Monday on family day, and that was our, uh, when she, wee baby Arthur and I had her first trip out to the mountains. <laughs> he did not wear a kilt, <laughs> someday he will. Um, yeah, he was very well behaved on the car drive there, not so much on the way back. So recent explorations and excavations in these hard to get to sites in, in the northern regions or in the mountainous areas have significantly extended the body fossil record in Western Canada. One of these studies from 2014 by Burns and Vavrick, in which they described some ankylosaur elements extending the record by approximately 12 million years. These ankylosaur elements come from the uh, early late Cretaceous Dunvegan formation, approximately 96 million years old. And they were identified by Burns and Vavrick as uh, ossicles. And together, ossicles together with larger osteoderms make up the characteristic dermal armor on the back of ankylosaurs. This is a paleogeographic map of what North America is thought to have looked like um, during the time that this dinosaur lived, about 96 million years ago. And back then, we, of course, we still have the Western Interior Seaway. These ankylosaur ossicles were buried on a large delta called the Dunvegan Delta, which extended eastwards into the Western Interior Seaway. A more recent study by Brown and colleagues in 2017 described a spectacularly preserved ankylosaur from the early Cretaceous of Alberta, further extending the fossil record by another, by another see if I can do the math here, 16 million years. This ankylosaur, Borealopelta mark Michelli, represents one of the best preserved dinosaurs anywhere in the world. And it's currently the centerpiece of the Grounds for Discovery exhibit here at the Royal Terrell Museum. This specimen was found by Suncor near Fort McMurray from the 112 million year old Clearwater Formation. One of the many, many interesting things about this fossil is where it was found. It wasn't found on terrestrial, in terrestrial sediments, it was actually found in marine sediments of the Western Interior Sea, which was a precursor to the Western Interior Seaway later on in the Cretaceous. This individual was carried off the coastline and drifted for some time before um, floating and bloating 
and sinking to the bottom of the sea, where it was found by excavators 112 million years later. Apart from Boreal Opelta, the clear water formation has produced a rich assemblage of marine reptiles, including three different plesiosaurs and one ichthyosaur. And finally, this brings us to our study. Our study describes some dinosaur bones from the earliest Cretaceous of Alberta, further extending the fossil record in Western Canada by another 28 million years. Our fossils come from the Pocatera Creek member of the Cataman Formation, which is part of the Blairmore Group. And these rocks are exposed in southern, southwestern Alberta in the Rocky Mountains in the Highwood Pass area. Black fragmentary bones were first reported from the site by a hiker in the 1990s, and this was conveyed to the Royal Terrell Museum. We, we rediscovered the site in uh, 2015. So the vast majority of the Cataman Formation consists of a upper conglomerate unit, which consists of large, often fist-sized so stones. The lower part is called the Pocatera Creek member, and this is a finer grain sandstone unit, which is where the fossils were found. Up until our study, no vertebrate fossils or trackways were known from the Cataman Formation. However, it was recently suggested by Kubo and colleagues that some of the stones from the Cataman Formation may have ended up in the stomach of this large-bodied uh, elasmosaurid plesiosaur, Alberta Nectes, several million years later, when this formation was actively eroding alongside the um, expanding Western Interior Seaway. So there isn't very much information on the paleogeography of North America 140 million years ago when the Pocatera Creek member was deposited. However, it was thought, there, there's thought to have been a narrow inland sea that existed and was the precursor to the Western Interior Seaway later on in the Cretaceous. The Pocatera Creek member was deposited along, adjacent, adjacent to the rising Rocky Mountains on a, uh, in a channeled braided river system on a north dipping paleo slope, which drained northwards up to this inland sea. One modern analogy for this drainage system are the tributaries of the Ganges River draining eastwards from the rising Himalayas. So this map over here on the right is essentially that region of India rotated 90 degrees. And that's more or less what the, more or less a pretty good model for what the Pocatera Creek member was like 140 million years ago. And this is our field site. As you can imagine, it was somewhat challenging to get to being on top of a mountain and even more challenging to remove fossils from. As you can see, the rock units are heavily folded from millions of years of mountain building. So interpreting the geology can be a little bit tricky. As you can see over on the far left, we have exposures of the Mist Mountain Formation, which, if you recall, yielded the oldest trace fossils from Western Canada, the sauropod footprints. So what's neat about this picture is that you can see that the dinosaur body fossil record has almost caught up with the trace fossil record, and it's just on the verge of surpassing it. The field site is, it's a pretty spectacular hike, to say the least. <laughs> it's, um, very stunning, lots of wildflowers, and the hike starts off in uh, a heavily wooded area, but as you move towards the top, it gives way to a much steeper scree slope. Hiking poles are definitely a must, but once you get to the top, the view is just incredible. It's definitely worth the hike, and definitely, it definitely has to be one of the most scenic fossil sites in the country. So like I said, the fossils were found in the hard sandstone of the Pocatera Creek member, when we were up there in 2015, as we accumulated more and more sandstone blocks containing these fossils, we soon realized that hauling all of this material downhill by backpack was quickly becoming beyond our means. Luckily though, we managed to have cell phone service up there and were able to call a local helicopter company, which obliged to airlift our material to the parking lot down below. So that made for a very epic day. <laughs> you could almost just take the scene and put it in Lord of the Rings and it would definitely be in place. So this is one of the sandstone blocks that comes from this site. Moving upwards through time, we can see that there's an alternating sequence of pebbles with, cross, with a finer grained cross bedded sandstone. These layers represent a high energy depositional environment. And as you can see here, there's one bone shown here. In other blocks, there were multiple bones. Uh, these bones were located in multiple sandstone lenses indicating that these bones accumulated over multiple events, possibly flash floods. So preparation of this material is ongoing, 
But currently, this is one of the best preserved elements that we have so far. As you can see, it's incompletely preserved, but it's relatively flat and is V-shaped in cross-section with a distinct ridge on the upper surface and a concave lower surface. The first thing that came to mind, our minds, was that it belongs to an ankylosaur being part of an osteoderm. So by comparing this fossil with better preserved ankylosaur osteoderms from the late Cretaceous Dinosaur Park formation of southern Alberta, of course, like all, basically all ankylosaur osteoderms, you have a distinct ridge running alongside the top surface, like you see in our fossil. Also, like our fossil, osteoderms are commonly concave on the ventral surface, on the lower surface. Another feature that we noticed was that our fossil has a distinct rounded pit on the upper surface, which is quite commonly found on other ankylosaur osteoderms, such as these ones here from the Dinosaur Park Formation. So we were, uh, we were very confident that our fossil belongs to an osteoderm from some type of an ankylosaur. So the next step was to see if we could determine the orientation of this, of this uh, osteoderm on the original individual. The first thing we noticed is that the ridge on the upper surface thickens as you move from one end to the other. If you look at ankylosaur osteoderms, you see the same pattern with the ridge thickening towards the back of the body. So right away we could tell which was the front, which was the back. And if you look at the uh, tail end of the osteoderm here, you can see that the, on either side of the ridge, the slope is a different angle. On the left side, it's a steeper angle. On the right side, it's more shallow. You also see this on ankylosaur osteoderms with the steeper left side facing towards the midline of the body and the other one, of course, by default, facing towards the side of the body. So we effectively narrowed it down to 50% of the body. Um, that's, we're not sure if we can take it any farther than that, but at least we've eliminated half the body. So after deducing that this, uh, this uh, fossil belongs to an osteoderm, as well as other fossils that resemble it also being osteoderms, we CT scanned one of these osteoderms and tried to determine based on the relative thickness of the hard outer cortical bone versus the inner spongy cancellous bone um, to get a better idea if we could figure out what type of family this ankylosaur belonged to. Based on this examination, we found that the, based on these comparisons, that these osteoderms are most consistent with that of a polycanthid ankylosaur. This is a tentative um, identification of this fossil pending the um, preparation of additional fossil material from this site. Assuming that it belongs to a polycanthid ankylosaur, polycanthids are a basal group of ankylosaurs which lacked a tail club and also had a continuous shield of armor over the pelvic region. And they're represented in North America by taxa such as Gargoylosaurus and Mymora pelta from the Morrison Formation, the late Jurassic Morrison Formation. So our tentative identification of these fossils as belonging to a polycanthid ankylosaur is consistent with the North American ankylosaurian fossil record. In North America, we have polycanthids extending from the latest Jurassic up until the end of the early Cretaceous, and the uh, clubbed ankylosaurids and nodosaurids collectively extend from the end of the early Cretaceous all the way up to the end of the Cretaceous. We could safely say that we had an ankylosaur from this site, and this effectively makes this individual, these fossils, the oldest dinosaur body fossils from Western Canada, extending the record back another 28 million years to about 140 million years. Some other interesting aspects about these fossils are that it just so happens that the, the oldest dinosaur body fossils from Western Canada described since 2014 just so happen to all be ankylosaurs, just by coincidence. So you can really say that ankylosaurs are really leading the charge on extending our understanding of dinosaurs in the early Cretaceous of Western North America. Our fossil, these fossils also are significant in the context of the North American dinosaur fossil record. So if we look at the latest Jurassic and early Cretaceous of North America, we'll just look at a few sites that have, have uh, produced dinosaurs. One of these is Northern Wyoming, which has produced dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous Cloverleaf Formation, as well as the late Jurassic Morrison Formation. Another site is in uh, South Dakota. We have the early Cretaceous Lakota Formation, 
which is intermediate in age to those previous two formations. And if we look at central Utah, again, we have another data point helping to fill in this record from the Cedar Mountain Formation. As you can see, up until our study, there was a roughly 20 million year gap between roughly 145 to 125 million years ago, where there were no dinosaurs known from this interval. Fortunately, our site falls within that gap, helping to fill in that part of the record. Another fossil that came from the site, which we had a lot more difficulty in trying to determine what it was, was this element right here. And as you can see, it's very small, just a couple centimeters across, which again, accentuated the difficulty in making in a us being able to identify it. So we approached Don Brinkman here at the Royal Terrell Museum, and he very kindly uh, weighed in on this. And drawing upon his vast understanding of turtle anatomy, he was able to very quickly determine that it belongs to a uh, part of the plastron or lower shell of a turtle. So this effectively makes this fossil one of the oldest turtle fossils from Western Canada as well. Up until this point, we can say that this site includes multiple different species, and including a ankylosaur and turtle. And like I said, uh, many of these sandstone blocks are still undergoing preparation. So stay tuned for further updates to see if we can um, hopefully expand the community present here at the Pocatera Creek member. So in conclusion, I have many people and funding sources I would like to thank. I would like to thank the Dinosaur Research Institute for providing funding in the form of uh, helicopter lift support and funding for preparation of some of this material. I would also like to thank the uh, Royal Terrell Museum for inviting me to give this talk today. And of course, to all of you for all of your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>